This is Veldhoven, a small town in the Netherlands, a country right here in Europe. When we think of the Netherlands, we often picture this, and this, or him, who's known for that, and that. And for many, the Netherlands is also synonymous with, yeah, that. But did you know that currently, the Netherlands, and more precisely the small town of Veldhoven, is at the heart of massive geopolitical tensions between two global superpowers, the US and China? To really understand how Veldhoven got into this situation, we need to take a closer look at what's causing all the tension, how the European Union fits into the mix, and then we'll look at what we can expect to happen next. The ongoing situation, which some are referring to as a cold war between the US and China, does not revolve around territory or religion. Instead, this conflict is about technology, and in particular, microchips. Before looking into why they're so crucial, let's start with what they are and what they do. The first microchip looked like that, and was created in 1959 by this man, Robert Noyce, who later co-founded Intel. And let's get one thing straight. Semiconductor, chip, integrated circuit, all are used to mean roughly the same thing. This is Chris Miller, and he's the author of this book, Chip War, the fight for the world's most critical technology. Semiconductor is a uh, piece of silicon, usually quite small, the size of a fingernail, that has carved into it billions of tiny circuits. And each of these circuits is turned on or off by a device called a transistor, uh, which is like a, a big electronic switch. When it turns the circuit on, it produces a one. When it turns the circuit off, it produces a zero. And this is how all of the ones and zeros that undergird all digital computing are produced. So all of the data we store, all of the uh, data we process, it's all tiny circuits flipping on and off um, uh, billions of times uh, on the chips inside of our computers, our iPhones, or our data centers. And the more transistors on that tiny piece of silicon, the better the computing power it has. The one made by Robert Noyce had four. Today, the chip in your phone has billions. In addition to becoming more and more powerful over time, semiconductors have also become an extremely important part of our lives today. Donc l'ensemble de ces puces électroniques se trouve aujourd'hui ben, dans tous tout, tout, tout les objets qui nous entourent. This is Jean-Pierre Rascal. He holds a doctorate in applied sciences from the Catholic University of Louvain and is specialized in advanced transistors. Ça va de la machine à lessiver au, euh, au, smart, au smartphone, euh, au, au laptop, à la tablette. But also in cars, dishwashers, microwaves, coffee makers. Uh, and the number of chips that we rely on every day is growing every single year. You almost never see semiconductors because they're buried deep inside of uh, the devices we rely on, but a typical person will uh, make use of thousands of semiconductors over the course of their daily life. Their deployment in almost every object we use in our daily lives has made them an extremely lucrative market, and it keeps getting bigger. From an industry worth $412 billion worldwide in 2019 to $580 billion in 2022, and it's expected to reach the trillions by 2030. So why all the tension if it's a growing market that brings money to the different players involved? It's all to do with the relationship between those different players, and to understand that, we need to look at the supply chain for semiconductors. So the semiconductor supply chain is, is quite complex given the high tech nature of this good and, and given the high degree of specialization that is needed to produce them. This is Nicolas Poitier, research fellow at Bruegel, a think tank based in Brussels, devoted to policy research on economic issues. And as a result, we see quite a division of labor globally, where different countries and different economies play specific roles in the, in the value chain. To make it easy, we can divide the chain into three main parts. The first part is the design of the chips. Which is basically laying out the, the kind of structures that's going to be on the chip in the end when it's produced. And this design stage is mostly done in the United States. The second step is the manufacturing of the chips. And this is mostly done in East Asia. 
specifically here in Taiwan, which represents more than 65% of the manufacturing market, and here in South Korea, which accounts for more than 15%. And the last step is the assembly and packaging of the chips, basically putting them into actual products you and I buy. The leader here is no big surprise. China plays a very big role when it comes to actually the goods that are produced using these chips. So now you're starting to see the problem. In an industry that is extremely interconnected, China is at the end of the chain, heavily dependent on the chip designs made in the US and the manufacturing power of Taiwan. To understand the extent of the problem for China, you also need to understand that not all chips are made equal. Low-end chips are, for example, the ones used in your car to check if your door is open or closed, or if your windscreen wiper is on or off. On the other hand... When we talk high-end, we talk about uh, laptops, smartphones, this kind of IT goods. But not only that. You know, advanced computing has always been harnessed by intelligence uh, and by military um, uh, arms of, of government, whether it's the British computers in Bletchley Park that cracked Nazi codes during the Second World War, or the US use of supercomputers to track Soviet submarines during the Cold War. There's a direct relationship between computing power and military power. At the high end, Taiwan and South Korea are the ones uh, that, that are relevant here. Actually, more than just relevant. One company alone, TSMC in Taiwan, makes 92% of the high-end chips in the world, and Samsung in South Korea, 8%. They are the market of high-end chips. This means China is dependent on Taiwan and the US for both its basic chips, the ones we find in our coffee makers or fridges, and for its advanced chips, the ones used in military equipment and advanced computing. Now let's go back to Europe and Veldhoven for a moment. Europe is a bit outside this main streamline of, of production. We're not, we're not really big in the design on chips, we're not really big in the production of chips, but we are a very vital component when it comes to, when it comes to uh, the broader ecosystem. The machines on which these chips are produced uh, come from the Netherlands. And only from there. And more precisely, from Veldhoven, home to ASML, the world's leading supplier to the semiconductor industry. Et cette société là en Hollande, euh, elle est la seule à fabriquer des machines qui permettent de faire ce qu'on appelle la lithographie, c'est un peu de la photographie si vous voulez, à l'échelle nanoscopique pour réaliser ces, ces, ces semi-conducteurs. You can't make advanced chips anywhere in the world without machines from the Netherlands. But ASML is not the only company in Europe that matters. Let's go to Oberkochen, a small town not that far to the east of Stuttgart in Germany. The home of Carl Zeiss SMT, the sole producer of the mirrors and lenses used in the world's most sophisticated chip-making equipment. Without them, no fancy machines at ASML. And without the machines, no high-end chips in Taiwan. So as you can see, the global manufacture of semiconductors is complex and incredibly interconnected. So, why is that a problem? Well, firstly, superpowers like the US and China don't want to be reliant on each other for a product that's so vital in today's world. Unfortunately, we produce 0% of these advanced chips now, and China's trying to move away ahead of us. But according to the US, it's also a question of national security. The US is trying to stop China from getting access to these advanced chips, uh, because if it does, uh, the U.S. government believes it will apply these to defense and to intelligence systems. We need these semiconductors not only for those Javelin missiles, but also for weapon systems of the future that are going to be even more reliant on advanced chips. Today I'm signing the law of the Chips and Science Act, a once-in-a-generation investment in America itself. The United States must lead the world in the production of these advanced chips. This law will do exactly that. And that was the US's reaction to the situation, taking unprecedented steps with its Chips and Science Act, a bill that not only boosts its national chip production, but also limits the sale of advanced chips to China to block them from getting ahead in advanced computing, AI, or even weapons of war. We see now uh, chips policy is not just pursuing supply, security of supply goals or industrial policy goals, but really also geopolitical goals. And the bill doesn't just affect the US and China, it includes restrictions that forbid anyone from selling certain chips and manufacturing equipment to China if there is a US component or design involved. And remember, 
Who is the world leader in chip design? Yes, the US. So it puts pressure on companies and countries all around the globe. So in this global chip war, the US seems to be winning. It's attempting to choke China's access to the technology, while at the same time offering grants and subsidies to companies making semiconductors in the US. And if you're wondering what the European Union's reaction to all of that is... The College of Commissioner has adopted today the European Chips Act. Yes, their own Chips Act. In the European Chips Act, we are combining investment, regulatory framework and the necessary strategic partnerships to make Europe a leader in this market. All right, so the EU CHIPS Act, it's 43 billion euros of policy-driven investment until 2030. But when we look into it, actually only around 15 billion of that is new. The rest was already being invested. And compared to the 280 billion dollars of the US CHIPS and Science Act, it's a reaction beaucoup, beaucoup trop faible au regard des réactions des autres, uh, des autres pays. So the European CHIPS Act is, is, is a reaction to two things. It's on the one hand the reaction to this kind of new geopolitical role that chips are playing now and in and, and direction to the US seeing that China and the US are investing big in the sector and asking itself, should we do this as well? But it's also a reaction to the shortages that have uh, haunted some important EU industries, the automotive in particular. We've set ourselves the goal to have in 2030 20% of the global uh, market share of chips production here in Europe. That would double its global market share in chip production, but currently this is a part that the EU isn't very good at. So is it even possible? Certainly not. Everyone is focusing right now on production of chips. Not, not just the EU, but also China, the US. Who is more, most credible? Certainly not the EU. By concentrating on increasing its chip production, is the EU barking up the wrong tree? What should it be aiming to do? The target should be much more to make sure that we maintain this technology edge where we have it. The Chips Act really goes for the most thought of their part, the most crowded part, the most expensive part. And I think that is a bit of a mistake when it comes to strategic autonomy. There's around a half a trillion dollars of chips sold each year, but they're far more important than that because the devices that rely on chips constitute most manufacturing output. Which makes the risk of shortages extremely worrying. The world economy would be sent into a deep depression because uh, the manufacturing of all types of goods would be immediately disrupted. No more smartphones, a big disruption for cars, dishwashers, coffee makers. We would be facing the greatest manufacturing crisis since the Great Depression of the 1920s. 1929. The stock market crash has come, and the Great Depression has begun.